I'd like to introduce our speaker who is in here. And that's Aaron. And Aaron is, how do I describe you, Aaron? I don't know the answer to that, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> You're an adventurer, an artist, a field collector, a real good field collector. Oh, thank you. A photographer. Uh, a member of the uh, Mindet. Are you still on the Mindet group? You're one of the managers? Yeah, I'm one of the managers. Of, of Mindet itself. And if you don't know Mindet.org, it's one of the, the best reference research uh, tools on mineralogy that's out there. And um, uh, that's how I met Erin. And then she's joined us on the uh, women's mineral retreat groups. And she's an active seller online. And what else can I tell about you? Um, I'm also part of Friends of Mineralogy. Um, I'm on the national board. Um, I'm one of the admins for the Young Mineral Collectors Group. Um, I think that's all of the organizations. I do stuff with our local club too. And I think that covers it, Mary. Maybe I'm sure there are some other outlying things. I'm, I'm involved in a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and she's joining us from Farmington, New Mexico. And one of these days when COVID is over, Jim and I are gonna go field collecting with her in New Mexico, because that's Jim's home state. We're gonna have a great time. Yeah. So I don't know how to proceed from here. Well, I think I'm just going to share my screen and does that look like everybody can see us? Okay, I think I can see us, so I think we're good to go. Um, I do have the chat open in a window. So if you guys are muted, if you run into any kind of problem and you need to let me know, I do have this visible so you can beep at me and we should be good to go. Um, so I'm presenting to you today on the Blanchard Mine. So the geology and the history of the Blanchard Mine is intrinsically tied to its geography. So the first thing that I wanna do is make sure that we all know where we're at. Um, just as a reminder, New Mexico is located in the southwestern United States. You are muted. Uh, are we unmuted? How did that happen? I don't know. Hmm. We okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, now we can hear you. Hear you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I don't know where we cut off, but we'll just start again. Um, so anyway, this is New Mexico. We are a state in the United States, in case you didn't know that. There are some people who forget about that. Um, we were first incorporated as a territory in 1850 and were admitted as a state in 1912. The borders have changed several times in that time period. Arizona used to be part of New Mexico and we're still a little bit bitter about that. Um, all New Mexicans, just so you know, have a pet rattlesnake and live off a diet consisting entirely of green chili. <laughs> Okay, so just to get more familiar with the landscape surrounding the Blanchard Mine, we're going to take a little flyover. So the Blanchard Mine itself is located in the northern part of the Sierra Oscura, or Dark Mountain, in Socorro County, New Mexico. And you can see that kind of in the lower left or lower right portion of your screen. The San Antonio, um, town of San Antonio is situated on the nearest water source, which is the Rio Grande River. To the east of San Antonio lies the basin Hornada del Muerto, which translates into Journey of the Dead Man. 
So as we start to move east, we pass the town of Carthage, which was a ghost town that is associated with the first coal mine in New Mexico. Then as we come up towards the base of the Sierra Oscura Mountains, we find the Chloride District in the Hansenburg Hills. This area is of further note in the discussion of the history of the Hansenburg District, so just pay attention to where that's at. Now 26 miles from San Antonio, we reach the Blanchard Rock Shop. This is also the town of Bingham and that is exactly everything that is there. Now five miles south from that, we pass the Royal Flush, the Mex Tex, and a few of the other mines that make up the Hansenburg District, and we arrive at the Blanchard Mine. So I'm gonna give you a little overview here of some of the locations at the Blanchard. It could be argued technically that the Blanchard Mine is a group of mines. It's really the Blanchard claims and there are several different things going on here. Okay. Oops. Sorry guys, I'm trying to run too many things at once. Okay, so before we talk about the history and the specimens of the Blanchard, I'd like to give you just a brief background into the geology of the district. Um, extensive work has been done on this subject and the following information relies heavily on the work of both John Recavan and Virginia McLemore. Um, I'm happy to connect anyone with those sources if you'd like to dig further into the geology. I'm going to be really brief about it. Um, the Hansenberg deposits were originally classified as Mississippi Valley type deposits, but due to key differences have since been reclassified as Rio Grande Rift deposits. McLemore gives the following definition. Rio Grande Rift deposits are characterized by a unique regional geologic setting, simple mineralogy dom dominated by fluorite and or barite, low temperature of formation at less than 200 to 250 degrees Celsius. Deposition is open space fillings with little or no replacement of host rocks, common paragenetic sequence, and no obvious direct association with any magmatic or volcanic activity. The Sierra Oscura themselves are composed of basement rocks of Proterozoic granites and gneisses overlain by Pennsylvania formations of limestone shales and interbedded arcosic sandstones. Mineral deposits occur primarily in open space fillings related to karsts within the council spring member of the Pennsylvania Madeira group limestone. So you can see there's a little star in that stratigraphic column that's the layer that we're dealing with. Evidence supports that karstification occurred both as the result of weathering during the Pennsylvanian as well as contemporarily with mineralization. Um, and for anyone who's less familiar with geologic terms, karst refers to a topography that's formed by the dissolution of soluble rocks, such as limestone, dolomite, and gypsum. So we're mostly talking about cave structures. The Sierra Oscura are composed of a series of north-south trending fault blocks. Displacement along the Oscura Fault is the result of the Rio Grande Rift extension with major movement beginning about 7 million years ago. A second unnamed fault zone occurs at the base of the escarpment. Southeast trending high angle faults cross cut the Oscura Mountains throughout the Hansenburg District and show less vertical displacement than the north trending faults. Mineralization in the district formed from hydrothermal waters emanating from deep within the basement rocks underlying the Hornada del Muerto Basin. Two theories exist for the movement of those basin brines. One is a combination of overburdened pressure and increasing temperature, and two is a topography driven or, driven or gravity flow. Solutions moved laterally to the margins of the rift basin and upward along route right bounding faults. Enriched brines moved into open spaces such as bedding planes, faults, fractures, and solution cavities where they precipitated barite, fluorite, galena, and other minerals as the solutions became supersaturated. Many theories exist regarding the source of enrichment in these fluids, but I don't know that any kind of um, firm determination has been made on that. The paragenetic sequence begins with a deposition of silica, including some silicification of the host rock. The second stage introduces the main ore minerals, which is minor replacement of carbonate by galena and barite, then open space filling by galena, minor pyrite, and sphalerite. This is followed by, and to some degree overlapped by, barite, fluorite, and quartz, which locally co-precipitated. 
A third stage has been proposed as the oxidation stage, which is responsible for many of the secondary minerals at the deposit. And these are formed as the hydrothermal system evolved from hotter reducing conditions to cooler, more oxidizing conditions. So the condensed version of all of that is that a lot of the collectible minerals of the Blanchard mine formed in cave-like cavities of various sizes, which provided the open space for these well-formed crystals. So the history of the Blanchard mine is longer than you might suspect. Many indications exist to show that indigenous peoples were aware of and made use of both the copper deposits in the Hansenberg Hills and the lead deposits in the Sierra Oscura. A lithic cache was found at the Salinas Pueblo filled with altered galena that has been attributed to the Hansenberg district. There is another Rio Grande Rift deposit located in the Sevieta wilderness that has been suggested as another possible source for these galenas. Um, but it's, there's no question that Native Americans made use of Hansenberg lead, primarily in pigments. Early reports include um, mentions of Mexican workings and of old Spanish tunnels up to 300 feet long. Um, there's no direct evidence given to support whether these workings were Spanish, Mexican, both, or even possibly still related to indigenous peoples. They're not very specific about it. Um, whereas the Pueblo made use of both the copper and the lead deposits, the references to Spanish and Mexican usage seem specific only to the lead deposits. Now, the earliest publication that makes mention of the Hansenberg district comes in Minerals of New Mexico World's Fair edition, where not much is said about the deposits, but Fayette Jones credits Pat Higgins for the discovery in 1872. However, several pieces of evidence indicate that it is unlikely that Higgins had much to do with Hansenberg at all. Three years prior to the supposed discovery by Higgins, the Santa Fe New Mexican reports that Captain R.B. Willison is leading a party to explore the Sierra Oscura in search of a story of mineral riches. Nine days after the report of the expedition, a party reports back of terrible hardship, detailing a lack of water, that one member of the party has died alongside his horse, and that no mineral wealth was found at all. Now, 11 days after that report, a report from Captain Willison himself refutes the previous claims. No one has died, and they were never without water for more than a day. However, Willison's report does detail that in order to find water, the party marched 60 miles towards Fort Stanton in Lincoln County, then spent the remainder of their time exploring the Sierra Blanca Mountains. No mention is made of mineral wealth in the Sierra Oscuras, indicating that they probably did not find any. The district is silent until 10 years later, when in 1880, J.A. O'Neill, A.H. Hansen, and W.T. Harris set out in the dead of winter to search for an ore deposit reported to Harris by old Lorenzo in his Leta Pueblo. Hansen makes the first discovery on New Year's Day of 1881. The first set of claims detailed here are in the Hansenberg Hills of the newly established Chloride District, so where we saw earlier in the flyover, that set of hills before you hit the Sierra Oscura. Recorded 20 days later, the second set is um, located in the Sierra Oscura proper. So the early history of the Hansenberg District is made particularly confusing by the vague usage of names in the area. Um, the first name that we see is the Chloride District, which includes the Hansenburg town site, which was named in honor of A.H. Hansen. This is followed by usage of the Headquarters District in 1901. The area is also often referred to as simply Oscura. There is no nomenclature during this period to distinguish the copper deposits down in the Hansenburg Hills from the lead deposits in the Sierra Oscura. So inferences just have to be made from the context of the document to try to establish which area is actually being talked about. Um, reports from the lead deposits are pretty sporadic. Most accounts seem to refer to the copper mines and the chloride district is heralded as the new source of New Mexican riches. Though most of the attention is on the chloride district, there are some really interesting stories that come out during this period of time. So in 1881, a lengthy and dramatic report is made of the Enchanted Cave. Several miners discover an entrance to a cave where a strong current of air swept with a dirge-like sound resembling the harmony of an Aeolian harp. The miners descend into the cave on steps hewn in solid rock and detail phenomenal cave formations. 
Wreaths of pink sulfates of lime, quartz, and spar studded the sides, and the rough miner for once lost his individuality and found himself in the fairy's realm. Stalactites from the roof fully 50 feet from the floor and stalagmites running up to intersect them halfway made the vast chamber have the appearance of an alabaster cathedral. The miners apparently have quite an adventure when an enormous animal sprang from its lair, the report of a dozen revolvers put out the lights, and when the party started back to the entrance, they found the carcass of a magnificent mountain lion 11 foot from tip to tip. Now if that wasn't enough, the story's not even over yet. After an exceedingly fatiguing ascent, the whole party were again thrown into disorder. Shots are fired and the lights go out again. One miner gave a leap, seizing accidentally in the dark what he thought was his torch, but realized that he had the terminal extremity of a monster rattlesnake, measuring eight feet in length and eight inches in diameter. It was reportedly brought back to Hansenburg, dressed for its oil, and when opened, a brass collar and padlock worn by Jack Hansen's bullpup, which had disappeared some days before, was found. The skin of the snake was put on exhibition in the Cabinet of Minerals in Joe O'Brien's Palace Saloon, open to the inspection of all. Later newspaper announcements include a mention that a mammoth rattlesnake, rivaling the one recently found in the Enchanted Cave, is on exhibition at Joe O'Brien's Billiard Hall, followed by Joe O'Brien wants some prairie dogs for his pet rattlesnake. A good chance to earn some money, boys. Though the cave is described as a brisk walk, likely from the town site of Hansenburg, this locality is now lost. We also see a report that O'Neill, Hansen, and Proto purchased the claims of the Pueblos, which is interesting because at the time, the Pueblos didn't have any claims or legal titles. Many speculations can be made regarding the reasoning for this, including that it may have been an act to satisfy any possessory rights held by the Pueblo, or that it is in some nature tied to old Lorenzo's original tip to the Harris regarding the district. Now, like any new mining camp, the Chloride District is surrounded by extraordinary boasts of ore values. Um, there are some incredibly far-fetched claims of silver and gold content, and these reports continue throughout the history of the area. The question of silver has been long debated about the Hansenburg district. There's no supporting geologic evidence for Argentiferous Galena in the Hansenburg district. Um, the geologic conditions are absolutely wrong for that to occur. Um, the reports of gold are even more puzzling. Regardless, proprietary numbers in the coming era alongside multiple theses still record silver content and occasionally gold. Now, in 1892, we see a mention of the district's mineral specimens as forming the most beautiful cabinet specimens to be found in New Mexico. Enthusiastic and regular reports of the riches of the chloride district begin to wane and um, optimism declines. Early reports boast of readily accessible water, then of plans to sink wells, which clearly were not effective. Similarly, reports talk about plans to connect a railroad to the Hansenburg area, either from Carthage or from San Pedro, which was a ghost town southeast of San Antonio, over to White Oaks in Lincoln County. The railroad never came closer than Carthage, which was still over 20 miles away across the Jornada del Morto, which is a long way for lead ore or copper ore. Reports indicate absence of activity in the Chloride District from the mid-1880s onward, and the closing of the post office is the proverbial nail in the coffin. The chloride district has boomed and busted. A Dr. E. Peters issued a rather prophetic statement regarding the lead deposits in an 1882 article in the Engineering and Mining Journal. The present outlook is not a tempting one, and several miners who are engaged in sinking shafts on two or more of these veins are to, are to be commended rather for the perseverance they are displaying under depressing circumstances than for their judgment in the selection of a mine. The district goes silent. In 1916, activity in the main range of the Oscura resumes when Western Mineral Products constructs a dry concentrating mill at the Rimrock Tunnel, which is likely one of the old Spanish tunnels re referenced in previous reports. A private report written by Marion McCarthy for Western Mineral Products Company includes a map of the mining camp. The Rimrock Tunnel in an open cut is depicted on top of the hill with the gravity tramway running down the mill. Um, this is the origin of the name of the McCarthy Lead Mine, which is now a synonym for the Blanchard Mine. 
Um, and for those of you who might be familiar with the Blanchard Mine, this is um, how the map lines up with the current site. So there's considerable documentation of the Western Mineral Products Mill, which is great. Here we see the framing of the mill. And an image of the brand new building. Um, note the cisterns used for catching water. And according to um, McCarthy's site map, the building in the foremost portion of the image, the little wooden building, would have been the mill blacksmith shop. Um, on the right hand side of the photo, you can see part of the tramway running up the hill. So the tramway ran ore by gravity down to the mill. So you would have one cart full of ore that would go down and pull the empty cart back up the hill and then you would just go back and forth. So this photo shows a view of the entirety of the site from the Rimrock Tunnel. Um, the rail pictured in the lower left foreground would have run off to a waste pile. Now McCarthy's report also includes a plan of the mill. So for people who like mills like I do, I just wanted to include some detail here because it's really neat. Um, Johnston in 1928 describes that ore was received at the mill in a 50 ton bin. From this bin, it was shoveled over a grizzly and spalling floor to a 10 by 20 inch Blake breaker. From the breaker, the rock went through a series of rolls and trommels until reduced to 12 mesh. This crushed material was allowed to fall through an ascending blast of air to be de-dusted into the crushed ore bin. A plumb pneumatic jig was fed from this bin. The power unit is situated adjacent to the south side of the mill and consists of two semi-diesel engines totaling 100 horsepower. Um, this mill only acted to recover the galena. And because it was a dry mill, it was a very um, dusty process. So one shipment of lead concentrates were made to a smelter in El Paso. Uh, predominantly lead, but silver was also reported. Um, we mentioned earlier that the you know, reports of silver originally could be attributed to the hype of a new mining district, but reports of silver from this point forward are active production numbers. Um, reports of silver and gold continue throughout the rest of the mine's history, and you are free to speculate about why that is because it shouldn't be there. Western Mineral Products Company operated the mill for one year and then the property fell idle. In 1936, we see the earliest known advertisement for Blanchard mine specimens. Despite earlier note of mineral specimens and this indication that they were being marketed, historic Hansenberg specimens seem to be missing from collections. Neither the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources Museum nor the University of New Mexico Museum have specimens dated any earlier than 1957 to 1958. The oldest known specimen in a museum that I've been able to find any documentation of is a fluorite that resides in the Harvard Mineralogical Museum that was purchased in 1950. Now in 1936, brothers W.E. and F.L. Blanchard, aged 66 and 56 respectively, begin to file claims, beginning what will become decades of Blanchard family ownership of the area. It does not appear that the Blanchards had much success operating the mine themselves. There are only two reports of small ore shipments in 1938 and 1939. In 1941, we see a report that the Cooney Mining Club field trip visits the Hansenberg lead mine. This is the earliest record of a collecting field trip to the Blanchard. Now the lack of early reports from the Blanchard Brothers operation may be tied to a detail found in the recollections of Porter A. Stratton, son of Earl Stratton. In January of 1942, the Blanchard mine was included in the Alamogordo bombing range that would eventually become the White Sands Missile Range. All property holders in the range area, predominantly ranchers but also miners, were told that the government was leasing their properties and they would be returned to them at war's end. In 1945, the world's first test of a nuclear weapon was de detonated at the Trinity site, which is marked here by the yellow star. Per Stratton's recollections, at war's end, it became apparent that the government had no intention of returning the property. The Blanchard brothers requested the help of a congressional delegation to have their mine excluded from the range. They were successful and resumed operations. One could presume that the notch in the northern border of the White Sands Missile Range that perfectly excludes the Blanchard Mine from the boundaries may have something to do with this series of events. 
By 1947, the Portales Mining Company is leasing the property. The Portales Company is composed of four men from Portales, New Mexico, Paul Ridings, Clarence Barrett, T.T. McCaslin, and Earl Stratton, who is the father of Porter Stratton of the previous recollections. There are reports of the Portales Mining Company production from 1948 to 1954, primarily of lead, but also copper, zinc, silver, and gold. In this instance, the report of zinc is unusual. Um, zinc is certainly present at the Blanchard, but this is the only record I've come across that makes any mention of the production of it. During this time, the Portales Mining Company built a crusher and ore bin near the Portales at it, which was previously known as the Rimrock Tunnel. Between 1950 and 1951, both W.E. and F.L. Blanchard die. After F.L. Blanchard's passing, his wife, Ora, waited a short time until her youngest daughter graduated high school, and then she moved into a house at the base of the mine, later also living in another small house near the Blanchard Rock Shop. Visitors from around the country and the world came to visit Ora's mine. She reportedly kept a ledger of all her visitors and was seeking to fill all 50 states. The vehicle in this image belonged to the photographer. Um, as far as I'm aware, Ora did not own a car. After the Blanchard brothers pass, reports list the ownership as Blanchard Estate. At some undetermined point, some ownership of the property is transferred to Bertie Cleghorn, listed in different sources as a successor to Phil H. Blanchard Decease, as a niece, and as a protege of F.L. Blanchard. Um, a 1958 report states that the Blanchard Cleghorn Group, consisting of six or seven claims, is owned in undivided interests of 11 24ths by Mrs. Blanchard, and 13 24ths by Bertie Cleghorn of Portales, New Mexico. Um, it's still not entirely clear who Bertie Cleghorn was, but it is of note that Ora Blanchard was not the sole owner of the property. Stories about Ora differ greatly. Many visiting New Mexico Tech students or techies were in fear of inciting her wrath. One recalls, I had been warned, I think, that she was reputed to eat snakes, lizards, jackrabbits, and maybe even techies. At least the jackrabbit portion of this was confirmed by her daughter. Others befriended her and regularly visited to bring her canned food and other amenities. Reports will vary as to whether Aura would charge a fee. If she did, it seems it was a small enough one to be easily forgotten. She would request to view the specimens collected and held the right to take from them as she chose. Aura spent much of her time reading and it is reported that her, much of her small house was filled with not only mineral specimens, but also with books. She taught herself the basics of geology, mineralogy, and hand specimen identification. In a letter to Dr. Stuart Northrop, she stated, I am as ignorant as the toad by my step, but it has been a fascinating game of learning to identify the minerals. After around seven years of Portales Mining Company operation at the Blanchard, the Portales Mill in San Antonio burns down and operations cease. Paul Ridings succeeds an interesting a group from, um, from Texas into leasing the property under the name of the Oscura Mining Company. The Oscura Mining Company constru constructs a dry concentrator on site, which cost approximately $200,000 and was unsuccessful. Um, many bad feelings arise between different parties at this time. Um, this coincides with a dispute with Clarence Barrett and the upper workings multiple efforts to establish actual boundaries to the claims, um, a lawsuit that eventually pushed the Oscura Mining Company out of the property, and just all around nastiness that lasted well into 1958. So here we can see the, remo the remains of the Portales Mining Company crusher and ore bin and the Oscura Mining Company dry concentrator. Uh, many of these structures are still on site today. Um, the Western Mineral Products Company mill would have been situated further down on the Hillstein Center left in this image. Nothing remains of that structure today. In 1958, the Sunshine Mining Company, a silver company best known for the operation of the Sunshine Mine in Idaho, begins exploratory work. This includes, most importantly to mineral collectors, driving six adits totaling 2,300 linear feet, numbered one through six to reflect the sequence in which they were driven. Per Porter Stratton's recollections, writings of Portales Mining Company believed that a larger company may be able to profit at the Blanchard and he was the one responsible for contacting Sunshine Mining Company. After exploratory work, the Sunshine Mining Company is interested in operating the property, but determines that ore prices are currently too low. They work to negotiate a lease agreement in which advanced royalties are paid up until the mine can operate profitably, 
after which the advance royalties would be subtracted from the current royalties. Ora Blanchard refuses this provision and the negotiations end. Sporadic mining continues for the next several years. Ora had a congenital heart defect and was not supposed to live into young adulthood. This did not deter her. She was a wife, a mother, and lived simply in desolate conditions, regularly trekking up the mountain to show visitors around her mine. While her daughters worried for her failing health, Ora stubbornly refused to leave. In late 1967, another family member came and placed her in a nursing home. Ora lived there for a month or two, and in February of 1968, she passed away. Her daughters reportedly claimed that separating Ora from her mountain was what killed her. Reports disagree as to what exactly happened to Ora's belongings. Ultimately, though, it seems that most, if not all, of her belongings were either stolen or destroyed, including her beloved specimens, her books, and her ledger. After Ora's death, the new caretaker on the scene was Sam Rattlesnake Jones. Sam had previously lived in Socorro, and he and his wife Vera had a very close friendship with Ora. Sam and Vera moved to Bingham after Ora's passing and maintained the rock shop. Sam would, for a fee, take visitors up to the Clarence Barrett workings, which he would turn over with a backhoe and allow collecting. He had a pit outside the rock shop in which he kept rattlesnakes, and he would reportedly remark that anyone caught trespassing on the claims would be thrown in his snake pit. Over the next few years, Basic Earth Science Systems, Inc., or BESI, conducted exploration, including core drilling. Now, in 1979, Rene Steensma, who was a Dutchman who spoke seven languages, had the equivalent of a master's degree in engineering and was associated with both Hansenberg Mines, Inc., as well as Mineral Operating Company, proposes a new method of milling that would render mining at the Blanchard profitable by processing all three economic minerals, galena, as well as barite and fluorite. Mineral Operating Company, or Minopco, begins building the mill. $2 million was spent in milling equipment and construction costs. The mill ran for less than 30 days and then clogged with fines. It is likely that the failure was recognized within a week. Control of the Blanchard Mine Group passes to Western General Resources. In 1983, no assessment work was done, and since the claims were unpatented, this left them open to claim. In 1987, the Blanchard Mine Group was claimed by Ray DeMarc and Brian Huntsman. Now we have to backtrack a second because I want to tell you the story of Brian Huntsman's 1980 Lenorite find. This was prior to Ray and Brian's claim. Brian was trespassing at the time. Brian's Lenorite pocket, as it's usually called, wasn't really a pocket. It was many chunks brought down by blasting a loose slab from the ceiling. Brian and his friend blasted down the rock, waited for the dust to settle, and then began to rummage through the pieces. They started coming across crystals that didn't look like anything they had ever seen, and it took them a while to comprehend that the crystals were actually linerite. Brian's friend was completely speechless. Brian apparently just kept saying, oh my God, over and over again. And they thought that they had struck it rich to the tune of maybe $6,000. Brian recalls three pieces around four to six inches of snow white quartz with multiple freestanding linerite crystals, seemingly all with different habits. Now Brian's friend reportedly issued a warning that someone is coming, but Brian doesn't remember that at all, only looking up to see a light turning the corner, catching him like a deer in the headlights, and the announcement, stop what you're doing boys, you're under arrest for trespassing. Sam Jones, the sheriff, and the deputy sheriff had arrived. Brian and his friend are arrested, spend 12 hours in jail, and then are released on their own recognizance. After a week of sleepless nights, they returned. It was all gone. Tucson comes around and the find is the talk of the show. Brian and his friend go to see the material and end up spending three to four hours in the bar that night planning how to go back. Rumor circulates that the find totals a quarter of a million dollars, although it's unclear where that number comes from. Soon after, Brian returns to the mine with a different friend. After having trouble with their lights, Brian goes outside to check to see that all is clear. It's not. There are three human silhouettes. Brian is holding a rifle and said to me that he is forever grateful he didn't do anything rash, since prison is full of guys who wish they had those five seconds back. Brian is arrested again and spends a couple of weeks in jail. 
He eventually gets out on a plea deal with probation, um, an agreement to write a newspaper article discu discouraging others from trespassing and under strict instruction to never go there again. Uh, Brian's comment to me regarding the affair was, no big deal, now I own half the place. The new owners take on the property with enthusiasm, operating with the sole purpose of recovering mineral specimens. The mine has long been made available for field trips for mineral clubs and educational groups. Trips were led as early as August 30th, 1987, when the Albuquerque Mineral Club took a trip that was the first time Mike Sanders collected at the Blanchard. In 1990, Mike Sanders joined in partial claim ownership. Here we see a photo including several well-known figures from the mineral world. From left to right, we have Bob Jones, Marty Zinn, Ray DeMarc, Barbara Munchen, and Peter Bancroft. Note the date of um, November 11th. This would have been a field trip held prior to the 8th Annual New Mexico Mineral Symposium. This um, trip to the Blanchard Mine associated with the New Mexico Mineral Symposium still happens every year. Now, specimens. The Blanchard is best known for the Blanchard Blue Fluorite, best set in, um, in stark contrast on white quartz. Many Blanchard fluorites are beautifully color zoned, most commonly seen in purples and blues. Color ranges to purple, to green, and rarely an exquisite blue-green. Um, for those of you who get Rocks and Minerals magazine, this specimen was on the cover of the issue previous to the latest. Cubes are dominant at the Blanchard, but a range of other habits exist, including hexoctahedral, tetrahexahedral, trisoctahedral, dodecahedral, and octahedral, and any combination of all of those. Quartz as um, a mineral specimen is relatively uncommon at the Blanchard. It occurs primarily in cavity linings associated with the original silicification of the limestone and as a late stage overgrowth. Smoky quartz and amethyst are known to occur, um, but as far as collectible specimens, they usually involve a quartz coating over other minerals, including fluorite, galena, or barite. Of Brian's linerite discovery, this is perhaps the specimen that most people are familiar with. Uh, much question exists about where the other specimens ended up. There are reportedly two in the Smithsonian and one at the Paris School of Mines. The rest are suspected to have ended up in black hole collections. Um, there is another more daunting possibility to explain the missing specimens. So after his probation from the second arrest is over, Brian goes back to retrieve his rifle and has a conversation with the sheriff who remarks, those crystals you guys were getting were really pretty. I got me a few pieces of that stuff that night. He describes them as all kinds of different ones like the skyline of San Francisco. Brian recognizes this as similar to the three exceptional pieces he remembered studying in the mine and asks if the sheriff still has them. The sheriff responds, nah, the kids probably broke them up and they got swept out the door. On a broad scale, the mineralization in the Hansenberg district is fairly uniform. Um, there are exceptions of phenomenal finds found only in one pocket and not yet seen again. Exceptional crystals of linerite pseudomorphing 2 malachite were found in one pocket in the sunshine number four. Similarly, one pocket of V-twin cerusite crystals up to six centimeters was found in the sunshine number six. Barite is common throughout the Blanchard, but most often is massive intergrown crystals. An intact barite crystal from the Blanchard is relatively hard to come by. Here's another exceptionally sharp example of barite coated in a late stage quartz. Gypsum is found throughout the Blanchard, often as late stage filling or pods in remaining empty cavities. However, there are also exceptional gypsum crystals. Please note the scale on that. The previous specimen was extracted from this very pocket. Um, here we see examples of the massive gypsum pods Aura Blanchard reportedly referred to this material as petrified snow, which is fitting. For all the attention towards Galena in the history of the mining of the Blanchard, Galena is not often the thing talked about in the mineral collecting world, 
Um, I think that's a shame because they are my favorite thing from the Blanchard and are one of the more interesting mineralogical occurrences. Nearly every specimen of galena at the Blanchard is altered. The vast majority of Blanchard galena specimens on the market have been abraded to reveal the internal unaltered galena. And you can see an example of this in the left-hand image. The specimen on the right has not been abraded, but was enclosed in a caliche protecting it from alteration. Now the primary alteration of galena is anglesite. Here we see an, a really interesting intergrowth of galena with fluorite, and um, the little orange specks on this are actually little wolfenite crystals. The anglesite will then alter to cerusite. Now, some of these alterations can be very extreme. Um, the examples pictured here are often called exfoliated galenas and show a parting along the vertices of the cubes. Um, this is caused by a change in the volume as galena, lead sulfide, alters to anglesite, lead sulfate, and then to cerusite, lead carbonate. A number of the Blanchard galenas also show a distortion away from the cube to a rhombic form. Uh, this may have something to do with the alteration process, but to my knowledge, this has not been studied. Now, many of the secondary minerals are often associated with the altered galenas. Because of the chemical relationship, linerite is frequently found paramorphing altered galena crystals, resulting in either a partial or complete coverage of the cubes. Here we also see malachite pseudomorphing linerite. So um, for a fun bit of provenance, this specimen was collected by Mike Sanders on his very vis uh, first visit to the Blanchard. Another interesting association that is relatively unknown from the Blanchard is galena with matramite. Very little remains of any of the primary sulfides. Um, they're typically only seen in cases where they were encased in another mineral and protected against alteration. Sphalerite is typically only found encased in gypsum pods, and chalcopyrite occurs similarly as well as in micro-inclusions and fluorite. Um, the breakdown of sphalerite, though, has resulted in secondary hemimorphite. This is a more unusual example of hemimorphite from the Blanchard as it's included with cuprite. Another zinc secondary is found in isolated occurrences of smithsonite. Brochantite is common throughout the Blanchard mine. Um, there is a tendency to label anything green from the Blanchard as brochantite, um, but there is also a fair occurrence of malachite and occasionally antlerite as well. So if you go collecting at the Blanchard and everybody tells you everything green is brochantite, be a little cautious with that. Um, at one point, there was a movement to name a new mineral species Blanchardite. Um, unfortunately for Aura Blanchard, this wasn't possible because that mineral turned out to be brochantite. Another fairly common acicular tuft that you can find at the Blanchard is a cyanotrichite. They are very hard to get out of the mine intact though. Cyanotrichite can also be found intergrown in late stage gypsum. Now, it would be very irresponsible of me to neglect the micro world that occurs at the Blanchard. Um, not all micros will be shown here, but I will try to include some of the interesting ones. Antlerite is very rare at the Blanchard, um, but it can be mistaken for brochantite. Ray's tip to me was that if you check the striations, the striations on um, Broach and tight run parallel to the C axis, so longwise, whereas on antlerite they run perpendicular, so they go across the crystals instead. Acicular sprays of R calcite are fairly common. Um, Broach and tight occurs as micros. Um, you can get really interesting specimens that are in varying degrees of alteration to chrysocolla. Now, as I mentioned before, malachite does occur, and you can see why you might mistake that for brochantite. One of the top micro finds on a Blanchard collector's list is caledonite. Cerusite occurs frequently, especially in association with altered galena. Um, Chrysocolla, again, can occur in a variety of interesting forms, many as alterations. 
Um, there are a few minerals that are not well known to occur at the Blanchard, including cinnabar, as well as cuprite and native copper. Uh, corkite occurs that could be easily mistaken for jarosite. Coronadite. Um, and covalite. So in, early reports regularly mention covalite as one of the primary alterations of galena listed immediately after anglesite and cerusite. Um, some galenas do show a superficial uh, iridescent film, though this is not usually recognized to be covalite. Um, there was some experimental work done by Yoshihiro Kobayashi that has demonstrated that covalite can form as a superficial alteration on galena. Um, whether that's actually what's happening at the Blanchard or not is something that I still need to confirm, but it is possible for that relationship to happen. Cyanotrichite occurs in a variety of different forms. And again, is susceptible to, um, to alteration to chrysocolla. Now, a wide variety of microfluorites can occur as well. Um, here we see a colorless combination of the cube, octahedron, and dodecahedron. Frapentite is another unusual find at the Blanchard and can occur as pseudomorphs. We see microhemimorphite and hydrozincite. Now, jarosite out of sight. Um, Jurassic has been instrumental in studying the conditions of mineralogical formation in the Rio Grande Rift. Argon-argon dating of Jurassic in the Hansenberg district has revealed that mineralization ages are between 3.8 to 8 million years ago, which is remarkably young in geologic terms. Um, since the Rio Grande Rift is an active rift zone, many deposits may even still be currently forming. And it's kind of pretty for little brown things. Um, there are exquisite linerite micros. This is one of my favorite images. Murdochite can occur as octahedrons and also as cubes. Otavite is a bit odd at the Blanchard um, because the Blanchard is not known for having much cadmium content. It's suspected that this may be a result of the dissolution of primary sphalerite with minor cadmium impurities. Platinite is one of the many little black ugly things you can find. Uh, pyromorphite is very uncommon at the Blanchard, but interestingly, there was a recent find at the Royal Flush of the world's ugliest vanadinite. So it seems very likely that the pyromorphite vanadinite series both occur at the Blanchard. Rosacite is relatively uncommon, but it can occur as one of the secondary minerals associated with altered galena. Scrutinii is a type locality mineral of the sunshine number one at it. Another collector favorite from the Blanchard is spangolite. Spangolite is certainly more predominant at the neighboring Mextex mine, but occurs in several areas of the Blanchard. There's sulfur crystals. And then another micro favorite is wolfenite, which is most often found as dipyramidal crystals. Um, there's been much work done regarding the history, geology, and mineralogy of the Blanchard mine. Um, and many questions still exist. Um, though the Blanchard mine was never a source of um, viable mining, it has a history rich with perseverance and determination, and to this day holds the same indes indescribable allure that has captivated mineral collectors for over 100 years. Uh, it seems very fitting to me that the mine carries on today, much like it did under the watch of Laura Blanchard. And a special thank you to everyone who helped me with this project. Um, I received an amazing amount of support from the mineral committee. And that's it. So I guess I will take questions. I think everyone will have to unmute themselves if they want to ask me things. Hi there. Hey. 
Thank you. You're yeah, welcome. that was great, Erin. Thank you. You're very welcome. Does anybody have any questions? Except I have one. When's the next field trip? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think it's been a little bit shut down out there to visitors just because, because there's of COVID. a pandemic. Yeah, um, you know, Ray's 80 something, 90 something. I think we're all doing our best to not put him at risk. So, I mean, typically there would have been a, a field trip last weekend when we had the New Mexico Mineral Symposium, but that was canceled. So, I, I don't know <laughs> when life is normal again, I guess. Somebody had asked earlier, Aaron, if it, you know, has anybody been able to go field collecting? I said, you had. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been out a fair amount uh, just this year to the Blanchard or? Anywhere. Oh, yeah, I've been out um, a few times this year. You know, I, I have my um, collecting partner, Phil Simmons, and I have kind of, we've just kept our social circle to us and our very immediate family. Um, but we've been able to go out a few times this year and have had decent success. Now you, for those who don't know, she and Phil are known primarily for all the New Mexico uh, exploration you've done. Yeah, we keep pretty busy out here. But does anybody anyone have any questions? I do. Can you hear me? Yes, I guess can. So what would be involved in a field trip to the Blanchard? What, what are regular mortals allowed to do and where are they allowed to go? Um, Ray has been generally very open with groups that he takes out there. Um, so typically what he'll do is he'll open the Sunshine Number 3 at it so people who want to collect underground can. There are plenty of spaces on the surface that you can also collect um, if you don't feel comfortable going underground. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it as far as where you can go. You know, I mean, I can give you some idea of what kind of things you would need to go underground if you're curious about that, but they're both underground and surface collecting options. When sure. You're out there. Yeah, sure. Talk about the underground. Underground. The underground of the Blanchard is one of the most amazing places that I've ever been. So um, I don't know how many of you have collected underground or have done, I assume all of you have done some field collecting. The Blanchard is one of the most rich mineralogical areas that I have ever seen in my entire life. So you walk in and it is this chamber and the entire roof of the mine is just solid fluorite. It's absolutely incredible. Um, the mine is for the most part fairly stable. Uh, Ray has a very hard rule about you do not hammer on anything above your shoulders because you do not want anything coming down on your head. Um, it is silicified limestone so it's very hard rock. Most of it is in pretty good shape, um, but the earth moves and stuff. So there, there have been incidents in the past in the Hansenberg district of collectors being killed by doing stupid things with rocks over their heads. So it's um, definitely something to be smart about, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty safe mine. Um, if you're going to go, you're going to want, obviously, a hard hat. You're going to want a light and a backup light. Um, I strongly recommend knee pads because then you can crawl around and not tear up your poor little knees doing that. It comes in really handy. Um, gloves, your typical, you know, hammer and chisel. Again, it is silicified limestone, so it is difficult mining at the Blanchard. Um, and, of course, you're trying to collect fluorite off of rock that's hard as heck, and you're beating on this rock, and your fluorite is just cleaving away as you're beating on it. So um, it can be difficult collecting, but it's it's a place that if you leave the Blanchard without having found something, um, you didn't get out of the car. There's no way that you come home empty-handed. We, we did have the women's um, group, which is an organization <laughs> that tries to get together every year and go to some place where we can field collect. And it's open to women of all ages and backgrounds and we try to do something fun. So the last one, um, unfortunately I couldn't attend, but it was at the Blanchard. Mm -hmm. And there were people that were, that stayed in town in Socorro. And there were people who wanted to go camping and there's camping right there on the site. 
Yep, you can, um, there's an old concrete pad where um, the Minopco um, facilities were that is perfect for camping. And, uh, and then we happened to do it the same weekend that the Trinity site was open mm -hmm. for people to, you, you can't collect there, but you could explore and, and see the area where they did let off the atomic bombs. And they opened that road onto the site twice a year? Yeah, twice a year. I, I had actually never been before, Mary, um, but figured since I had never been and I was down there that I would do it this year um, with the uh, women's retreat group. It, it was an interesting experience. It's a very long line. So if you were going to do that, um, you want to get in line at like 5 a.m. because otherwise you will be sitting waiting forever. <laughs> but it was fun. I, I would recommend it. It was an interesting thing to see. I don't know that I ever need to go do it again, but uh, it was neat. Yeah, they call it an open house and, and they, they allow people to drive through so many cars at a time mm -hmm. and, and actually see the site where the atomic bombs went off. Mm -hmm. And then you end up near the Blanchard Rock Shop, which is owned by uh, a woman, Allison, and mm -hmm. she and her husband have it. And there you can buy specimens of Trinitite and stuff, which is basically rock that's been fused by the atomic blast. Mm. You want to go, Carol? Yeah. <laughs> but maybe not right now. <laughs> yeah, Ray has been wonderfully generous in allowing people to go. No, I think he takes probably a good two dozen groups a year. He's very, very, very good about letting people come. And uh, Socorro is not that far away, so it it is a, a nice place to start from. And and. That particular weekend, there was the balloon festival in Albuquerque, the open house on the on the on the site, and field collecting at the at the Blanchard. Mm -hmm. So it was a fun-filled weekend. Yeah, and if you if you do end up coming through Socorro, you absolutely must stop at the New Mexico Bureau of Geology Mineral Museum that is hosted at New Mexico Tech on their campus in Socorro. Absolutely phenomenal museum. And I don't know, Michelle Shearer, if you remember Kelsey McNamara, who's worked for us. I don't know if you ran across her. She's worked for us a little bit at, at Icon Mining. Anyway, Kelsey is now, what is her title, assistant curator? Uh, I think she is curator and Virgil is director, but I think she's not assistant. She's She's got the full hat. Okay. She's doing a great Ooh. job. Yeah, I never got the privilege to meet her. No, yeah. she's, she's wonderful. Her and Virgil are one of two of New Mexico's greatest treasures. Yeah, so it's it's a really really good uh, museum. I wish we had as much space as, as they do. Um, and she works really hard on engaging the community and you know bringing the world of minerals to the larger uh, universe so that they can appreciate it, just like we try to do. Would you say the um, the name of the museum again? It's at New Mexico Tech. Yeah, they made their name really difficult. It is technically the New Mexico Bureau of Mining and Geology. No, I don't even have that right. NMBGMR, Geology and Mineral Resources Mineral Museum. Uh, but you can find it at New Mexico Tech. It's pretty well, they've got signs and everything, it's really easy to look up online to get directions. It's, it's pretty, it, they don't have it hidden. So yeah, so if you were, if you were gonna do a tour of New Mexico and you, you know, everybody goes to Albuquerque, you just drop south to Socorro. And About an hour. It, yeah, it's not that far out of line. And another neat thing to see in Albuquerque is the Atomic Museum. Mm -hmm. Where they have rep replicas of the fat boy and everything else, and they tell the story of the bombs. Yeah, and if you if you find yourself down in Socorro, um, about 
you know, the Blanchard is about an hour to the east. If you go about an hour west of Socorro, you end up in the Magdalena district and you can go check out the Kelly. Which is known for the wonderful Smithsonites. Right. What's, and what's, you, the, what's the collecting status at the Kelly? The Kelly is closed and is private property. You can um, stop at any of the little rock shops in town and it's like a $5 permit that they'll let you um, collect on the surface. Um, but underground collecting is absolutely prohibited. And and you don't want to. It's real dangerous. No. And you if you really guys don't. know Blue Shepherd, he's actually the owner. I think Blue I think Shepherd, he's half owner. Half part owner. Yeah. Blue Shepherd who has has the mines here in San Diego. And I as long as I've known Blue, he's never done anything with the Kelly. Well, that's typical of an awful lot of mines. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I, I've seen people do okay on the dump piles. It's definitely, it's been picked over pretty heavily, but specimens still turn up. So um, I, I think it's a neat place to visit just because a lot of the mine structures are still there. Um, so the head frame and some of the stuff is still intact and it's just kind of neat to see the, the old buildings, even if you don't find a darn thing, you know. And, I, and granted, I would... you don't have to pay to see the mine structures. Sorry, Mary. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I do remember, because I'm older, the uh, Tony Otero was the one who used to explore and bring uh, Smithsonite specimens to Tucson every year. Mm -hmm. And he literally, in his hotel room, would be filled with the blue-green Kelly Smithsonites mm -hmm. all over the place. And you just don't see it anymore. But I mean, th no. that's what he was known for. He'd always, he just had... I mean, it's like, if I'd only known, if I only had a couple more dollars in those days, you know, I would have bought a room. Uh, right. Yeah, I think um, one of the shops when you're kind of heading up the road to the Kelly is owned by his daughter, I believe is the relationship. And she does have um, material for sale. Um, most New Mexicans are of the opinion that the dollar prices she has attached to the specimens are absolutely absurd. Um, but you can go buy Smithsonite from her. It's just pretty pricey, even even for current market prices. Um, Tony was but of course. I'm sure she'd appreciate it if you did. <laughs> uh, Marjorie wanted to know a little bit more about the Women's Rock and Mineral Group. The, the women's organization. Um, it's a private Facebook group and it kind of started how many years now? Four, five years ago? Something yeah, like that. I got tied into this. It was this a way of, of getting women who were mineral dealers and the like to get together because we kind of felt outnumbered. Um, and it's now evolved to mineral dealers, collectors, just women who would like it an ex an adventure so we were setting up a field trip every every year someplace before the pandemic hit we had been talking about going to the mines in Maine and we were also talking about going to one of the Wolfenite mines near Tucson but we can't do that right now but they're on the back burner um, I'm somewhat involved in the organization and when things get better, we'll probably make an announcement that we're going to do another field trip. The last one, how many people went, Erin? That's a good question. I'm really terrible with numbers. I would guess we had probably 30 people. Maybe? Yeah, I think it wasn't yeah. a real big group, but it was, it was well sized for the mine conditions and everything. It worked pretty well. Yeah, and it was um, all ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from what we call the youngsters, <laughs> to some of us older folks so it was just mm -hmm. it's just open um as an organization and we want we want to set it up so we can have these once a year and it was great we you meet a lot of women from all across the country huh? and we've gone places like um we went and collected amethyst up at peterson mountain at hallelujah junction we had a tour that was down here in um, taking people to the mines of San Diego County and the GIA. 
They've done the Colorado uh, area for Amazonites. So, yeah, that's kind of the thing we want to do. It's just the you know we have this thing called the pandemic we got to deal with right now. Great. Well, not great, but pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Me. Thanks very much. It was super fun to hang out with you guys. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Aaron. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, you're and welcome. We will, thank you. we will try to have another meeting in December. 